Well, hello, people of Jamstack Conf London. Uh, this is a week later, a little bit more than that, after you were at Jamstack Conf London 2019, and I wasn't there. Um, that sucks, right? But it's because I was out mountain biking and I broke both my arms. I don't know if you can see this. There's not much to see. I'm not in a cast or anything because they have to heal like with movement or something. I don't know. I'm just doing what the doctor told me to, but it meant that I couldn't be there and that sucks. And I feel tremendously guilty about not being able to deliver my talk and participate in Gerald's workshop and stuff. That sucks, but hopefully I can make it up to you by giving my talk now. And, you know, it was important to me because I kind of designed this talk with the Jamstack audience uh, in mind. And it was, it's just about I don't know, like I've made my, you know, here's the talk title, right? Whoops, I guess we're full stack developers. Now that'll make sense as we go on, I hope anyway. Uh, but it's from the perspective of being a front end developer. Like I've spent my whole career kind of thinking of myself that way, you know, putting that on business cards when I can, although usually I go with a joke title, but you know what I mean? I, I, I think of myself that way. I like the term front end developer. It's meaningful to me. Uh, and it kind of turns out that it's meaningful to other people too, in a way. Like it's a it's a real thing. Anyway, I I, I work on CSSTricks.com, which is like a blog and a whole, you know a whole site, a kind of a resource site for all things kind of building websites, mostly focus on the front end. And then CodePen is all front end technology too, kind of a social network, you know, coding playground kind of thing. Uh, for dealing with front-end code. And I have a, a podcast where we largely talk about front-end stuff called Shop Talk Show. And what's cool about that is we're going on like 400 episodes. I've talked to hundreds and hundreds of de developers just on that show. And when you factor in my career and going to conference and stuff, I've easily talked to thousands of developers on what they do, what development means to them. I feel like I have a pretty good perspective uh, on all that. And front-end developer really is like kind of a real term, but it's shifting over time. And, you know, that's okay and kind of interesting, but it's, God, is it blowing up, you know, in, in the most interesting ways, you know? So I wanted to put a point on the fact that it, it really is a thing. Like, I don't think you need convincing of that necessarily, but let's put a point on it in the fact that people are paid to do it, which is the most real thing in the world, right? It's like a real job title. I know that because even I have a job board that's a part of CodePen in which the people post jobs and they use it. They just say front-end developer, front-end developer, front-end developer, over and over and over. That's what people are looking for. It's hot, hot, hot in hiring. And now, little self fulfilling fulfilling here i guess because this is a it's a job board for front end developers but look around on any job board you know whatever smashing magazine stack overflow anywhere of people that are hiring for web jobs and you'll see front end developer as the job title then you get hired and then that's your title it's like a real thing and the point of it is that it deals, you know, if you're trying to distill it down to like what it is, it's, it deals very directly with the browser and not just the browser, but the device that the browser is on and the users who are using that browser. And again, that might seem obvious too, but you know, it, that's a way to talk about it without talking about specific technologies and things. But, and it's not that other jobs don't have their browsers open all day long too. They totally do. But like front end devs are like in the dirt, man. They are like, we have it open all day, but we have dev tools open all day too. And we're digging around it and caring about the spectrum of browsers and devices and how people are interacting with those browsers and what they're doing with them. That is a very front end role kind of thing. Mina Markham put it best, I think. It deals with things that you can see, things that are actually in front of you on the screen in a web client and a client. And yeah. in my mind, anyone who works on a, you know, user facing interface or application, website, whatever, in my mind, that's a friend developer. Yeah. 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 If you're, you're, you deal with the client and the people that use this client. If it's in front of somebody, they're interacting with what you've built in some way. That's the front end kind of role. And it's distinguished from a back end role in a unique way, too, because it made me think like, I don't know, I know back end people that totally care about the users, right? Like they do. But but Monica uh, Dinkalescu was, was, wasn't afraid to kind of say it how it is in a way. I struggle to phrase it in a way that's like doesn't sound um, like the, a backend person doesn't care about the user or doesn't care about websites because they kind of do too, right? But they're totally allowed not to, right? Like if you're the person who's writing the SQL code for the database, I think you're totally allowed not to care about the user. This is your personal choice because at that point you're like delegating your responsibility. So I, what I'm trying to say is that I think it's totally fine to not want to call yourself a front-end developer too. 
Yeah, it's like it's not that you don't care about the users. It's just that your job has a bunch of other very specific responsibilities as a backend developer, and you're on a team where other people on that team's job is to do that other work that's a little bit more user focused. So there's there's event you know delegation happening or responsibility delegation happening there that is different. You know that's fine. So you deal with the browser. You're a front end dev. Your browser, browser, browser. It's all you deal with all day long. Great. There's a million browsers, so you're caring about mobile versus desktop and all the other places that browsers live and all the different browsers that are on there and what they're capable of and uh, uh, and that kind of thing. Really deeply, you care about that. There's a massive spectrum of them. This was kind of a cliche slide back in the when everybody and their brother was talking about responsive web design, which kind of is interesting on how that kind of won out, doesn't it? Nobody, people don't talk about it anymore because of how successful it was. It's just... Everybody, that's just how websites are built these days. That's amazing. So it's a job that you get and you get paid to do it and it's on your business card. It deals with the browser and the devices those browsers run on and the users. And if we're going to start talking about tools, that's great. There's a million tools around, but because we're dealing with browsers, browsers only speak a couple of languages, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So those are your job. Now, you know, if you want to be esoteric, it speaks a bunch of other languages, PNG and SVG and <laughs> Canvas APIs. And stuff. I guess that's part of JavaScript, but you know what I mean? It largely boils down to HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And, you know, that's just the way it is in a way. Those things are what browsers digest. That's what you need to know. Now, JavaScript is the interesting one there. Yeah, I, I would say it's indistinguishable from front-end development. It's just the way it is. It's this language that runs in the browser just like those other two. It just so happens it is a little different, and it's a little different that I learned in through my own experiences, but also in talking to the hundreds and thousands of developers that I have. That There's lots of people that are very successful front-end developers who just don't write a hell of a lot of JavaScript. They know what it is. They know what it's capable of. Maybe they know enough to be dangerous, but their front-end development career just isn't focused around it. Other people do that for them, but they're also super successful. They get a lot of work done. They think in systems. They're, you know, building sites for people and being successful in all the ways that you can be successful and then, and, but still don't just do a ton of JavaScript. And I just think that's interesting. It's worth knowing that you don't have to be a JavaScript expert or even write that much JavaScript at all to self-identify as a front-end developer and be successful there. Now, in this talk, we're going to end up, you know, just kind of assuming that JavaScript is a big part of what you're doing. And we'll get to that in a minute. A lot of that stuff that I was just talking about kind of manifested itself in my brain and life and career in an article that I wrote called The Great Divide, which was about that split, the fact that there are these two types of developers, some developers, and more and more and more recently, who are super focused on JavaScript. And it seems like their whole role and life and everything they do and build and work on and think about and talk about has to do in some way with the larger JavaScript ecosystem. And then all these other developers out there who just aren't a part of that at all. But they're both they both care about browsers and users. And for all those other definitions we have, it still says front-end developer on their business card all that, they're still front-end developers. So it's just funny. It seems like there's a divide between those two people. Not like a divide like like this stupid sentence I put at the top of this article where they have nothing to talk about while they're sitting at the bar. Of course, they do have things to talk about. We're all human. We all work on websites. There's plenty to talk about, it, but it's just an interesting distinction. And it's not like you can't cross the aisle. It's not like you can't work together. All that stuff you should be able to do. And I have a feeling that stuff is going to kind of shake out over the next couple of years anyway. Well, researching that on Chop Talk Show and talking to different people and stuff, Brad Frost, who kind of has a way of, I don't know, saying smart things that people latch on to, kind of coined this phrase that a lot of people I've heard repeat it since then. I don't want to sort of configure Webpack or like gulp like workflows and stuff like that. And so I, I found that I'm sort of on the more design, you know, the front of the front end and then sort of having somebody else that's more on like the back of the front end uh, as, a, as a nice sort of uh, uh, complementary role. <laughs> that is so awesome to me. A lot of people have, we don't have front end developers and back end developers. We just have front of the front end and back. <laughs> 
and back of the front end. That's what it feels like these days. It's crazy. That's why front end development is blowing up. It's so weird to think about in that way. And in fact, this has played out. It wasn't just a divide that I just invented. You know, I was accused of that a little bit of like drawing controversy or something where there isn't any. Uh, that sucks. I'm sorry if that's the case. But it, it turns out that big companies, you know, big and small have experienced this. And in fact, even at Google, there is front-end software engineers and UX engineers, one being more JavaScript focused than the other, and they're different career paths with different expectations and different ways that you can level up, and they get paid the same. So it's just, it's like a real thing. Uh, anyway, I like it. I still say front-end developer. I still intend to. I think it's still meaningful. It's just interesting. Uh, uh, and what happened there is, you know, we already talked about it. JavaScript got really, really big. If you need charts to convince yourself of that, it's the most popular talk language talked about on Stack Overflow and has been for a long time. It's the most popular language used on all of GitHub. Its package manager NPM is just leaps and bounds above the, of the amount of stuff on it and how much it is used more than... Uh, any other package library for any other language. So, okay, we're all front-end developers, right? Yeah, front-end development rules. We're already super different from one another. We have this foundation of we deal with browsers, we deal with the users who use those browsers, etc. We all know HTML, CSS, JavaScript, whatever, at least a little JavaScript. But in addition to that, we might be designers. We might be UX people. We might know GDPR really well. We might be photographers. We might be animation experts. We might be uh, good at accessibility stuff or really care about performance stuff or like dig into SVG a whole ton. We all have this smattering of other things that we know that our job is so cool because we get to actually use those things at work and incorporate them. So if we're going to metaphorize this, maybe at the tree trunk is all those core technologies, you know, as a front end developer, but then we spread out and we know a bunch of different stuff about different stuff. And that's already interesting And this metaphor, maybe is not perfect, but maybe it's a little bit more like this. And that on one side, there's all the front end developers who kind of just stick to HTML, CSS, and just like light JavaScript and have all these other skills. And then there's JavaScript focused developers who, you know, fundamentally know JavaScript, but the way that they branch out is different in the things that they know. It's like, feels like, you know, when I'm talking about a divide, this is what I mean. I don't think this is quite a perfect visual analogy, but you know what I mean. There's kind of a JavaScript people and not in a way. This talk is actually more about the JavaScript side. I feel like if we're talking about front-end developers, you know, from here on out, I think we're going to talk about people that are like, okay with the back of the front too. Uh, it's really about everybody, but you know, I just want to say that this is, I don't know, it's something more like that. And so here's a, what I think is interesting about that side of front-end development, almost like, you know, the JavaScript back of the front stuff is that it seems like over time, a lot of the stuff that we're doing has kind of moved stacks. And I know we haven't really like defined what a stack is, but I don't know, bear with me for a minute. There's things that used to be kind of like in the realm of what a backend developer could and should and did do that's kind of moved to something that JavaScript can do and even like a lot of times client side JavaScript. So one of those things that I think is interesting is, is component driven design and development. And this is one that just, I don't know, I guess it just feels obvious to a lot of people. Like, of course we build things in components, that's the way to go. But it turns out that, you know, there's all these JavaScript frameworks that tons of the web is being built in that have total dominance over front end development these days. It's incredible, especially when you add them all together, what's happening. They differ in approach. They argue about things. They People like one more than the other and like the approach and the thinking and yada, yada, yada. But interestingly enough, even the native version of this, which is web components, they all agree on components all the way of anything they disagree about. They agree that the way that you should build digital products, front ends, uh, uh, particularly for the web, but uh, kind of for anything, is to build things in components, big components, little components, but whatever, components, 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 which is interesting in that at least I don't feel that older school backend development really embraced that in the same way that is happening now. And it was much more like page based and just kind of overall page template based and BYO smaller components, but they, but are partials even, or just includes, but they didn't have the same kind of like, you know, I am a component, a testable, small, independent component that can be used anywhere. 
Uh, I feel like that has really locked itself in, and it's just a damn fine idea, and everybody agrees that it is, I think. Let's talk about components a little bit. Say you were building a website that I'm very familiar with, building CodePen.io. What's a component in this scenario, just to lock in what we're talking about? Well, how about that thing? Like, that makes sense, I think, to a lot of people that that would be a component. You know, there's no HTML element that describes that. I would just be kind of inventing my own word that describes that component. But... Well, sure, the whole thing is, but let's focus even deeper in. Look at that little heart down there. Sure, that's a component, and it literally is on CodePen. We call that the SVG icon component, and it's just nice to have because there's a variety of things that we do with it. It gives us a little API for displaying icons on the site that happen to be SVG. We pass a prop to it of what icon we want to display, and it displays. It's a very useful little abstraction for us as a component. Even that thing is a component too, though, because it's that pairing of a number and perhaps some functionality, like you can click it uh, along with the icon. So that's like an item. And then maybe all of it together is a component as well, because even that gets reused a number of times. So item meta, sure. And, you know, this card kind of comes along with its friends. There's a preview and a header and the meta. And then all those, uh, those components combined is an item on CodePen. It's just kind of a powerful component that can show any of our different item types. Now, I'm just talking about architectural structure and how we like build front end. So this is, I feel like, very relevant to modern day front end development. So you have an item, but then things get bigger and bigger. You know, all of them together uh, with pagination in our case becomes an item grid. Okay, interesting, interesting. Yeah, so it goes from there, but the idea of components is just, I think just it works. People like it and it you know, if it's, it's, it might be obvious to you if most of your front end development days come from, let's say you work in atomic design, Brad Frost thing, that's components all day long. Or if you, you know, if you use any JavaScript framework at all, it's just what you know. But I just don't think it was always like that. And it's, it's worth calling out right now. Front end developers like them. It is the way forward for, for design. It's like shaken out to be the way to go. Designers like them because they think that way anyway. I think modern design tools like Sketch and Figma and Adobe XD and these type of tools, they tout themselves as like component friendly. You know, you build these reusable parts uh, and, you know, that works because it enables good communication between the designers and the developers that use those components. It's just nice. And if you work with any other kind of developers who need to dip in and out, they're like, oh, components, I get it. I feel like conceptually um, the mental model of components just makes sense. So cool. Let's talk about something else. How about like overall site architecture? I feel like something that largely was a backend task that has kind of moved itself into JavaScript and even client side JavaScript in some way. So if you, you know, I don't know, all these JavaScript frameworks end up having some way of dealing with URLs in a way. But let's look at this. We have that we left off with this item grid component. And of course, the whole page is built from more components, right? There's the title component and some kind of view component for changing things and tab components and search components and sidebar components and user menu components, all this stuff. Really, the whole dang page becomes a component at some point. Sure, of course, as we're building the whole site this way, which means that really the URL is the component then. Yeah, it's the whole page, but it's represented by the URL. Like what's rendered on this page is URL driven, which means that all the other URLs are components too. And now... JavaScript has become the architect of the entire site. So it's, it feels like it used to be this job of a backend person kind of thinking about this and dealing with it and has become, largely become a JavaScript concern. I mean, if your site goes down this path of being constructed in that way, which I think is fascinating. It just is a, a job, an important job that has to be thought about and dealt with well, kind of moved stacks, which is kind of interesting. We've become these this this architect of the complete site if you're a JavaScript-focused front-end developer. That's worth noting, I think, because it takes all the stuff that you already had to do and think about as a front-end developer and just lumped more onto it. You you don't aren't absolved of anything else that a front-end developer needs to do. You just need to do more now. Interesting, interesting. Okay, so what about like getting data, for example? That definitely used to be a back-end concern. I can remember working on websites where I'm just like, I got this. I'll wireframe it out. I'll build the thing. I'll mock the data. I'll get it just right. And then you almost like, okay, I'm ready for you, back-end dev. And they come and they get the right data for you and fill in the holes of how it used to work. 
I'm sure plenty of people still work that way anyway, but it's starting to become more and more. If you're the back of the front type of person, you get your own data. You deal with your own state. You deal with the changing, manipulating, munging of that data. You are a data person now too, because hey, you're in JavaScript anyway, which is fully capable of that. There's all kinds of things, you know, like, I don't know, the page loads. So you hit a REST API with some Ajax library and get the data and then use it. And what's you know, this is becoming more and more and more true, especially with languages like GraphQL, which to me, you know, it means different things to different people. But to me, GraphQL is this big representation of, here you go, front end developers, you do this now. Not all of it, not all of the setting up, you know, and it, it definitely like crosses front end, back end boundaries, but it's really empowering for front end developers who I think aren't used to having as much power as GraphQL gives you on the front end. It's just like, hey, you need some data? Ask for it. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, so here's this card component, this item component, as we have it on CodePen uh, represented. I might be like trying to show a collection of pens on CodePen. A collection is just an arbitrary group of pens that users can make. So I might ask for that data, me as a front end developer building this, I would be writing this. I'd say, get a collection that has this particular ID. I need a little bit of information about the collection itself. And then I want all the pens. That's just what we call these things on CodePen that are a part of that collection. And I need, I need this much data to show what I want to show as a developer uh, on this particular thing. So just give it to me. This is just a what you're looking at it isn't pseudocode, it's GraphQL. It's a query for GraphQL. And what comes back from that query is all this data, everything that I need to create this page. If I don't need some data, I just delete it. If I need some different data, I just add it in here and I can play with this and get whatever I want, which is really empowering. It's not me hitting three different REST APIs. Maybe that's what happens behind the scenes. But for me as a front-end developer, it's just me asking for whatever the heck data I want. Really empowering for front-end devs. I might need to change data as well. It's not just always asking for data, which this feels particularly backending to me. When you change data, it's mutating data. That's why this is like this mutation component that you see. And we're in this world, we're looking at Apollo GraphQL. That's just how they, I don't know, that's the technology in use here. But it might be like that love button on CodePen. You click that, that number changes in this case from 229 to 230. Uh, uh, but that's a visual change, but it needs to ne needs to go back through the GraphQL layer so it, it can deal with changing that data on the database side. Almost surely a back-end concern at some point uh, ha has now become kind of a front-end concern. Like, you'd be wanting, you need to change some data? We'll change it and send it back through GraphQL. That's now a front-end developer uh, concern in a way. Fascinating. Uh, yeah, so that's what the mutation might look like that you, you know, you call this mutation and it looks a lot like, uh, the, the query, doesn't it? It's like, I'm going to be putting this data back changed just because we're talking about, I don't know, component specific stuff. This is a little aside, but what if the styles then for this component were attached right to it? And there's lots of different ways to do this. And I'm not advocating that just using regular old CSS is a problem too. Certainly, um, you know, approaches like atomic CSS and approaches like BEM are also like, here's a selector that's just for this component. So you, it's like a way of isolating styles just to a component. But what you're looking at here is we use a technology called CSS modules at CodePen, which is a pretty lightweight, I think, form of CSS and JavaScript. Notice the file extension here is still sass.scss. But the selector up top is root, super generic. You know, it doesn't even matter there. It's, it's kind of like punting on having to name anything. And I'm going to be applying this CSS just to this item component. And all these styles, you know, by the time they end up in the DOM, the way CSS modules work, it's not a class name of root anymore. It's a totally obfuscated, weird class name that won't conflict or clash with anything else. That's all CSS modules does in this case. It's just, it just obfuscates class names such that these styles are only applied to this card. And it's like kind of cool, I think. I think I've had enough like styling collisions in my life to just not want to deal with them anymore. It's kind of nice to have these styles that are isolated to this component, but also co-located. So if it comes time to like get rid of the item component, we don't need it anymore, you throw all of it away and it's all gone. So it has this dead code elimination ability too, which is pretty sweet. I, I you know, I, I, I do feel like 
the co-location of things when working in a land of of components is really strong and cool and smart and probably is going to prove out to be a, a smart front-end development technique. I point that out just to get to this point where it's like, so components, 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 right? We're front-end developers. We're building sites out of components. We all agree it's a good idea. These components kind of become these little folders that have all these files in them that all have their little jobs and there, it's all co-located together. So in this case, the way we've done it, we're, we're working in React. We have this index.js component. And that index component does any boilerplate stuff it needs to do. It's called index because it's ultimately easier to import that way. It deals with executing the queries and getting the data in. And then the named component, and like at the top there, home jobs JS is the one that is the template and does the rendering of the template. Notice the queries are broken out into its own file and the styles are broken out into their own file too. And it turns out it's just a really nice way to work. There are these little isolated, tested, useful little components that all just live in their little folders and are easy to reuse. And it's just a nice front end architecture. Now, it's still a bunch of work. Like it's just different than the old days of front end design. It's a very JavaScripty focused way of doing things that has a lot of additional responsibilities on top of what front end developers used to do in a way. Uh, uh, this is this is just a video clip from the GraphQL documentary apparently that was released not long ago. And uh, Kyle from Gatsby has a little speech in here that I, I think is appropriate. To me, GraphQL feels a lot like React. It just you know, you, you look at React, just like a whole bunch of, a whole class of problems that you had when you're building UIs just disappear. And with GraphQL, a whole class of problems around what is my data and how do I get it in the form that I need it and, you know, into, the, into, the, into the website just disappear. Um, and it really solves a lot of front-end problems. I know this, this wasn't a talk about React necessarily, but it kind of is and how empowering it can be and how... It really does, like I agree with Kyle, solves a whole class of front-end problems. Like I just, I remember, and I'm really still in the process of moving CodePen from a like, you know, Ruby on Rails backend rendered system with, you know, partials that made for kind of crappy components. Uh, um, you know, it doesn't really embrace that true component spirit over to React and just seeing problems melt away in a way. You know, it's not that no new problems were introduced, but it's just been a really nice transition. And then the transition to using GraphQL on top of that and seeing another class of problems just kind of melt away and seeing the front end developers who work on this product be really empowered to do a lot more than they were ever able to do. It's like they're front end developers. Yeah, but they're front end developers like stretched on both sides. They just do more than just a, you know, somebody that might just, just do HTML and CSS and convert some designs over. I think the front-end developers who work on our product are just a bit wider in scope and responsibility than that, which is interesting. So component-driven design, kind of a sort of a back-end thing that has moved its way into client-side JavaScript, which means all of site architecture can be done in client-side JavaScript, routing client-side JavaScript, getting the data that you need, talking to APIs, changing the data that you need, client-side JavaScript. The whole, all the state management that you need to do, all that thinky programming, what changes on the site, what's moving where, state machine stuff, client-side JavaScript. It's just amazing. So talk about that. You know, it, 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 those are new things, you know? That doesn't absolve you of just knowing enough HTML and CSS to pull off the design and the aesthetics of it and the consistency of it and thinking in a design system and making sure that is consistent and nice and efficient and matches what the designers want and the product people want and making sure that while you're doing all that, everything is accessible and tabbable and has the right color contrast and the things that are important that are executed at the front end design level worrying and caring about the performance of everything, worrying about that landscape of browsers and all the people that use those browsers and just treating them right and doing the right stuff, testing across the devices, sweating the UX of it, fighting against dark patterns, all that stuff that already is a front-end designer's responsibility, which is already a hell of a haystack of stuff to worry about, and then add on all that stuff on the right that we're talking about. Holy crap, that's a lot of work. It's that front-end job thing. We're piling stuff on there. The haystack gets bigger and bigger. Interesting, but no wonder that I'm started starting to think of us more as full-stack developers. And not just me, but a lot of people are self-identifying in that way a lot more. When they feel like they have the skill set across that whole spectrum, they're feeling a lot more full-stacky. 
you know, this is what Peggy from GraphQL. I think has like front end developer is such a broad term. Um, it's hard to really define like what exactly a front end developer is because there's so many different specialties, right? Like you can be um, a specialty, a specialist in SVG animations and be a front end developer and not write any JavaScript at all. Or you could be more working on the data layer uh, like I am and not writing any uh, CSS, for example, and still be considered a front end developer. So I think it's kind of, you know, as long as you're uh, touching UI or, or touching something like a data layer that's tangentially related to UI, I think, um, you know, you can identify as a front end developer. Yeah, I put that here because, yes, there's a wide array of, of responsibilities. And if you know it all, great. And you can think of yourself as full stacky in this front end dev term as a whole is definitely starting to feel more full stacky, but it doesn't mean that you can't specialize and you probably just will anyway, you know? So we're, we talked about this move stack stuff, you know, like back end to front end and stuff. Let's, let's focus in on that a little bit more. Say there's a spectrum of stuff that has to be done. Some of it is traditionally thought of as back end tasks and front end tasks. And we're not going to like, you know, reevaluate those things. We're just going to place things on the spectrum for a minute. So let's say like the operating system that your website uses to serve itself is like super back endy and like HTML is super front endy. And then there's this whole spectrum of stuff from databases to servers to, you know, all that front end stuff. You know, it's kind of a, a spectrum of stuff. Um, there's a stack called LAMP. Tons of sites run on LAMP. It's a really old stack on the internet, but it's still a heavily used stack today. It stands for Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. A lot of CMSs use this because there's a ton of CMSs that are PHP-based, like Craft CMS and I don't know, Perch and WordPress and things that like a huge swath of the internet uses are largely run on a LAMP stack. It's not that little pieces of this can't be swapped out. You know, a lot of Nginx usage these days instead of Apache or in addition to little stuff like that. But it's, it's largely in this chunk. That stack is talking about all backend stuff. It is a backend stack. And as a front-end developer, if you're working in that stack, you're like over here. You're doing front end stuff and not pretty much any of the stuff that's associated with the stack. You're just like, I don't know, I guess I'll make the templates and do some CSS and stuff. Cool. I'll be over here. Time goes on. A little bit of a newer stack is mean. You know, it's not like replacing lamp, but it kind of is, you know, it's like an alternate set of technologies that can be used. It stands for MongoDB Express, which is a web server. MongoDB is obviously a database. Uh, Angular, which is a front-end technology, interestingly enough, and, and Node as a server-side language. So it actually like is much wider what is being talked about when that acronym is being thrown around as where it sits on this stack spectrum. Way, way wider. But notably, it, it also not only got wider to the right, but it moved from the left as well. Like the operating system isn't referenced in that acronym anymore. And it's kind of like, who cares? Like, I don't feel like people talk that much about operating systems anymore. You're like, you use a stack, you push it up somewhere. Like who cares what it's using under the hood? Like the abstraction of that has just happened. You know, like we get further and further away from stuff like that, where we just kind of use some cloud something and it's probably fine. You know, like I don't really care what Netlify uses for its operating system. I don't know or care, you know, <laughs> it works. It's fine. <laughs> So if I'm a front-end developer and I'm working on a mean stack, I'm part of that stack. I'm working with a framework. I'm working with Angular. And because I'm working, writing JavaScript in Angular, maybe I'm messing with APIs and stuff too. And then I'm definitely dealing with all of the core front-end technology too. So I'm kind of overlapping with the way that that stack is talked about, interestingly enough. <clears throat> okay, so there's, you know, then there's serverless stuff. You know, I've been watching and caring about this, which is kind of cool. Notably, it moves way to the right. You don't care about the operating system for sure, but you don't even care about the servers themselves, like at all. You just write some code and it executes server-side stuff. I mean, the word serverless is broad and it means a bunch of things, but if we're talking about serverless functions, cloud functions, or, you know, functions as a service or whatever people like to call them, we're largely talking about just a server-side language uh, 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 powering APIs. That's like kind of all it is in a way. And that's kind of the world in which Jamstack stuff operates largely. So if I'm a front-end developer working in a serverless world, I'm probably like almost all of it. Like maybe some back-end people 
do more of that server side language, like actually the writing of the functions and stuff. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But if I'm really front endy, I'm pretty overlapped with all of it. Like I'm, I, I'm almost doing more work than the back end people are in a way. Kind of fascinating. Uh, Sean Wang, for, who's that Netlify, wrote an article for CSS Tricks describing a star stack or websites that are built with a star system, design systems, TypeScript, Apollo, GraphQL, and React. And I was like, uh, it was near and dear to my heart because it was kind of like, yeah, I can see that. A lot of companies are picking these technologies because they're doing a great job. And, and I don't know, you just see a lot of adoption of these particular technologies. It's powering lots of big sites. That If we're talking about that as a stack, it's all front end. You're hardly talking about anything server side at all. And it's just the way that things are talked about these days it's just on this spectrum, it's just shifting way, way, way to the right, which I just find fascinating. And if I'm a friend and now I'm all the way, almost all the way overlapped with that for sure. <clears throat> so let's focus on that word serverless just for a minute because we didn't really spend much time there or talk about it. I made this website. You can check it out at serverless.css-tricks.com. It's a little Netlify hosted Gatsby site um, that talks about what it is, but also like all the, what m the use of this site mostly is let's look at all the options and services available that fall into this kind of bucket. So I think one of the biggest deals with serverless is, you know, Jamstack is a part of it, but it's also this idea of cloud functions like that. I still need to do backend stuff. There's still lots of reasons that I need to execute server side code, but it doesn't mean that I need to spin up my own server to do it. I can write that stuff in, you know, a, a lot of different languages can run on serverless functions, but honestly, a lot of them just are in node because there's just a hell of a lot of people that know JavaScript and node is capable and fast and cool in that way. So I can write these little cloud functions, just like a little file called like do thing.js and working with a company like Netlify makes this so easy. I can just throw it in a folder in my thing and just deploy the damn thing. And that will execute not in the browser, but in node on a server on an AWS Lambda, which is so cool. <clears throat> so, you know, a lot of times when, when I'm talking about cloud functions, I'm talking about AWS Lambda or Google Cloud Functions or Cloudflare Workers or something that's executing this code, not in the browser, but somewhere else, like on a client or on a, <laughs> on a server somewhere. Uh, and Netlify makes that particularly easy. Here's an example of that, which I think is apt <laughs> to me anyway. Here's another site I have, conferences.css-tricks.com. It is a statically generated site using a technology called 11T that uh, uh, shows a bunch of upcoming conferences. You just go and so you can browse it and see what's up in the, in the world of upcoming front-end design conferences. I thought would be a nice way to build this site uh, is literally static site generated, not use a database or anything, but just have each conference just be as a markdown file, just an easy way to manage it, you know, and, and describe the content and then and use it in some way. And there's lots of static site generators that work in this way. Folders full of markdown files is just where it's at as far as static site generation is. Well, it's not required, but it, it's kind of nice. Um, cool. So there's that folder full of markdown files. Use 11 T to smash them together with some templates and build the site. Cool. Throw it on GitHub. That's kind of clutch because it means that in a way that usually a database can't, I've opened this up now to a world of contributions. If anybody wants to contribute a conference to this or edits or anything, they just can make a pull request on GitHub. And that is really empowering. I've gotten tons of pull requests for this thing, and it's really the, the powering of the whole thing is pull requests, which is incredible. So just being on GitHub alone is kind of a big deal there. And now that it's on GitHub, of course, that opens my deployment options wide open. Netlify is a great option for that. I can just point Netlify at that repo. Every time I push to master, it'll deploy the site to my subdomain here and rock and roll. It was the easiest thing in the world. The Netlify part of this is you know, took two seconds kind of thing. On top of that, if I want to not deal with Markdown and blah, 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 and I want to open this up to some kind of somebody that just isn't a developer and doesn't care about that, or even me, I could put Netlify CMS on top of this, which is an incredible thing, which we don't have too much time to talk about, but allows me to give a GUI on top of this content, including creating new conferences where I just pop into this GUI, change some dates, hit publish, and it goes live on the site and has a proper Git commit to the repo. So it's all in sync. It's kind of amazing. You know, I put Cloudflare in front of the thing. Sure, it's really easy with the subdomain. Just C domain to, or C name to the, uh, 
to where it is on Netlify and, and rock and roll. So if all this stuff is just so easy. I mean, partially it's because I've been doing this for a long time and leveling up my skill here, but I feel like it's just not as complicated as it used to be, all this stuff. I'm building a site that's statically generated, and uh, uh, I dealt with all the hosting, and I deal with all the DNS, and I'm like, I am, I am a webmaster. I am, I am doing it all. It's incredible. I can do even more than that. Check this out. You go to the site. You click on email conference info. It flips open this thing. You type in an email address, and it sends uh, 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 an email to that email address, of course, about information about that conference. So I go check my email quick. There it is, and you pop it open. It's cool. So to remind yourself, remind your friend or whatever. Pretty cool, right? That absolutely requires server-side technology to do that. You can't send an email client-side. just can't be done, right? So how do you do it? How do I do it? I'm not qualified to do that. I ain't no back-end dev. I'm a front-end dev. But I can do it through JavaScript because I can use some service, something like SparkPost, whatever. It's just a commodity product almost. That's like, it gives you an API for sending emails. There's a million of them. In fact, they're all listed on serverless.cssstricks.com. There's all these options for sending emails, but they have docs and they say, oh, to send, a, to send an email, it's so easy. Just pull our library off NPM and you know call this function with, with the body of the email that you want to send and the URL that, or the email address you want to send it to and then we'll send the email for you. It'll cost like a t zero cents, you know? Amazing. So it's like, I've re <laughs> yeah, I can do it all in JavaScript. Gosh, dang it. I just, that's empowering because it's like, I didn't have to learn anything. I didn't have to spin up a server. I just copy and pasted some code. I put an API key securely on Netlify and it kept it secure for me. And it just, I was able to write this function for sending a, uh, uh, an email through the ba a back end of the site with nothing. It's like I'm uh, that that feels extremely full stacky to me. All right, so let's think about this in a way. And over time, like by building this, like I don't have to care about the operating systems or servers and stuff. That stuff has largely just fallen away. I care about databases, but like not like in the way that I spin up a database server or whatever. I just care about data itself. Like maybe I'm just using APIs to talk to a headless CMS, or maybe my database is just markdown files in my repo, which I just deal with manually anyway. Or maybe my data is stored in a place like Fauna, which I deal with with APIs, or Firestore, which is like a real-time data store, or Firebase. Um, no, what's the new? There's a, it's not Firebase anymore. It's like Firestore, whatever. <clears throat> It's built to be used on the front end. So it's not like I'm thinking about databases, like I'm thinking about the methods of this library that I'm using that store and retrieve data. So it's, I just don't think about databases in the same way anymore. That stuff kind of falls away. And for server-side languages, it's just JavaScript. It's just in Node. I have that skill set anyway because I'm a JavaScript developer. Great. Uh, all this stuff, APIs, framework, JavaScript, yeah, that's my domain as a JavaScript-focused developer, and I'm a front-end developer. That's just fundamental stuff that I know. So it's kind of like, you're goddamn right I'm a full-stack developer. <laughs> you know, all that stuff. Plus, this feeling of, of power that I have because I know Git. I write tests. I can do basic design stuff. I know about configuring build processes and webpack and gulp and that stuff. I'm not afraid of that stuff. I deeply care about performance. I think it's fun to work on performance and make sites fast. I care about accessibility and know enough there to like do a good job. I can set up our deployment pipeline because it's probably pretty easy these days. And I know every other gosh darn thing that front end developers do because that's how I self identify and been working on it for a long time. So yes, I very, very much feel like a full stack developer. I'm not really just talking about me because I have lots Lots of rough edges in this world, like, you know, but lots of people are a lot better than I am. And it's no wonder to me that so many people are identifying as full stack developers these days because this is the world that they live in. They own this whole spectrum of being able to build stuff. And it's pretty darn cool and empowering and amazing that it's kind of like front end design morphed into full stack design. That's what it feels like to me. So. Uh, pretty impressive. That's what I kind of meant by the title of this talk. Oops, we kind of became front-end developers now. Now, I know that's a hell of a haystack. I like to point that out. That's a lot of stuff on that list. Even though some stuff has fallen away, more stuff has been added. If you're like totally going to unicorn out and be great at all this stuff, know that it's a lot of stuff. 
it's just a lot, you know, it's cool that you're able to do it all, but you probably won't be the master of all of it. And that's okay. You pr can specialize in parts of that stuff. You probably will specialize in some of that stuff without even knowing it. You'll just be better at some of it than you are. You'll like some of it more than other stuff. That's fine. That's probably good in a way. And you should talk that stuff up. You know, <laughs> it plays out like this a lot of the times, you know, you're a full stack developer. Sure. But you're really like really good at the back end stuff more than you are at the front end stuff. Sure. You can do the HTML and CSS, but because you use bootstrap or foundation or uh, one of the, yeah, I don't know, there's newer ones than that these days that are all really nice, but you know what I mean? It ends up like this sometimes. And this is where some of the little wars start and the prodding across the aisles get started because you're like, Sure, you can identify like that, or you get hired to do that, and then you're told to build a front end, and you really weren't super qualified to do that. You don't have near the, the front end chops as you do the JavaScript and back end-ish or back of the front type stuff, and it ends up you're a, you know, a kind of misshapen horse. And it's, 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 it's not fine because building bad products isn't fine, but it's fine that you are like that. It just means that the team needs to step up, and you probably need to hire somebody more like me who's more in this realm where I feel a lot more comfortable with the front end technologies and do back end stuff sometimes. But, but again, I'm a lopsided horse or a lopsided dragon in this case. So I just mean to say that it's kind of the team's responsibility to make sure that like high quality work is being done across the board. So just like back end people are like, this better be secure. This better be fast. This better be dealt with in the right way on the front end. I would say, well, back end people, all this stuff is non-negotiable too. Like all this stuff is all of our jobs, performance and accessibility and UX. We all need to be doing that stuff. It's not excusable to have crappy experiences on the products we build, you know, like just because there's lopsided horses, well then put them together and that kind of thing. So that's my whole point. You know, I guess I'll leave it at that. Uh, uh, thanks for coming to the talk. Thanks for going to Jamstack London. I'm sorry that I wasn't able to go and shake your hands there. I can't even shake your hand right now exactly because my stupid elbow is broken, but uh, a pleasure. So thanks and, uh, and take care and I hope to meet you all soon.